Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Once again, I have this wonderful opportunity to sit with you and relax. And let's listen to how the Holy Spirit has touched someone's life. Uh, the, the guest and I were talking before the program just a little bit, and it is true. We have on, as a guest tonight, an associate professor of psychology at, at Point Park University. And he mentioned we probably don't have that many psychologists on the program that talk about the journey of the faith, and that's quite true. And maybe we'll talk about why. We'll, and our, our guest is Dr. Brent Robbins. He's a revert, kind of, but a mm -hmm. former atheist. So, mm -hmm. Dr. Brent. It's great to Dr. be here. Dr. Robbins, just, good to have you on the program. Yeah. Well, I've been watching this show. It's, it's, this has been an important part of my own journey uh, back has been this show. I mean, I've been hearing people who... You know, a lot of people don't really know what they're talking about. I, don't, I didn't have much of a background in theology. And so being able to watch this show was really informative and helped me to answer some of the questions that I had at the time. So, you know, being on your show is a real honor. Well, that's but, you know. great. I mean, you, you weren't just sitting back and analyzing us all? <laughs> <laughs> of course, I'm always doing that a little bit. I can't help it. But <laughs> Oh, great. Well, it's good to have you here. It really is good. And it's great I'll to mention to the audience that we've, we actually had a chance, uh, my staff had a chance to uh, do a short taping of Dr. Robbins for a, a little snippet we do on our website called Signposts. So if you ever go to chnetwork.org, you can check out that little eight-minute snippet. But, but here we're going to hear the whole story. Right. So let me back up and invite you to start us way back in the beginning, if you will. Yeah. Well, I could, if I start off way back in the beginning, it's with mom and pop, right? Mom and dad. And I, I grew up in Washington, PA. Uh, and uh, as a child, and my both of my parents were Catholic. My my father, uh, you know, from an Irish Catholic family. My mother from an Italian Catholic family. And uh, and uh, you know, when my parents got married. I was, I pretty. They're pretty sure I was conceived on their honeymoon. So it was. I was right <laughs> out of the gate. And so I, I was their first and then only <coughs> child because my mother had gotten a uh, illness pretty early on called oh. sarcoid sarcoidosis, and it caused some problems for her in terms of having f further children. Mm -hmm. So she had had miscarried and wasn't able to. So it was just me, uh, and I remained an only child. So uh, so I had a close, as a lot of only children do, I had a close relationship with both of my parents. And uh, and things were going well. They, my, my father was working for his father, my mother helping, both of them were doing sales. And then, uh, you know, a tragedy hit the family when there was a there was a conflict in the family business, and my father became estranged from his father uh, because he basically let go got let go of the company. Wow. And my my parents started their own business, and then right after that, my grandfather passed away while mm -hmm. my father was estranged from his father, oh. and uh, wow. he was pretty heartbroken about that because you know you you know when you have that rift with a parent, you wanna you always hope you're gonna be able to. Yeah. You know, reconcile at some point, so mm -hmm. that that opportunity was lost. And I think my father was really pretty. I mean, devastated to say the least, and never quite got over that. And mm -hmm. then, and he went into a real kind of crisis where he had a he had an affair with somebody who uh, was working for my parents in their new business. Mm -hmm. And then my parents went through a divorce, and I think that was a real crisis for me. I mean, yeah. uh, my mother ended up. Uh, marrying a, someone who was a Presbyterian started going to his church, right? So even though I think she still identified as a Catholic, you know, she she wasn't practicing the faith. And uh, and my father, you know, at that time, he did eventually later come back uh, to the Catholic faith, way much later in his life. But at that time, he was, you know, he wasn't in that place. He was... Uh, yeah pretty lost himself. How old were you when all this was going on? So I was 12 okay. when all this was oh, happening. Wow. So I think because of all that that was happening, I really started to question things. I remember, uh, but I was also getting it, like on my dad's side of the family, because I think there was a lot of conflict or, uh, around their, their parents' divorce. Yeah. Uh, a lot of them had lost their faith. Many of them had converted to evangelical mm -hmm. uh, Protestants. And we're, a lot of them were working on me to try to get me to convert, <laughs> as you can imagine. Yeah. So, so I was hearing a lot of criticism of the Catholic faith, and I was getting invited to go to evangelical services. So I did. I, there was, I, you might have, I'm sure, sure you may have heard of uh, 
Greater Works Outreach, which is in this region. Yep. So I remember going to a service there, and it just, you know, after having grown up Catholic, it just didn't feel yeah. at home to me. It, uh, it didn't have the Eucharist, you know. Right. Uh, and, but... Um, was that mainly a... Was that a, a, a something out of the Jesus movement? That, you know what I'm saying? Was that a evangelical... Yeah, charismatic. So it was like... It contemporary was, music. It had a... Yeah, contemporary music. My sense of, in retrospect, it had a kind of Calvinist sort of flavor to their okay. theology. I wouldn't have known that at the time at 12. I, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't know one theology from another, you know, except I just had it just, it was much more intuitive. Like there's some, this was, it felt strange and alien to me at that, and I didn't feel like I fit in. I didn't, it didn't feel comfortable at their service, like, uh, because it was very different than what I was used to. So, so that been, didn't really draw me in. Had you been through all the traditional Catholic hoops at this point? Confirmed oh, yeah. Catechism? Yeah, yeah. And... I had been I had been to Catholic school. So I had okay. I had Catholic education in grade school. I went to Catholic high school as well, which is interesting. So my parents put me through Catholic school yep. but weren't themselves practicing. That was a real that was a strange situation. Uh and I remember having to go to confession and saying, yeah, I haven't been going to Mass. And then the priest would say, well, why haven't you been going to Mass? I was like, well, my parents don't go. And he was like, why don't you walk to Mass? And I was like, that would be kind of awkward. <laughs> see, if, see if mom and dad would go to Mass. I mean, I, I guess I could have, but uh, I never really even thought to do that until was, the priest brought it up. Yeah. Was, was God here at that point in your life, do you think? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I definitely had. I mean, this is what's interesting is I think, I don't think I ever fully lost a sense of the presence of God. But I think I just, there was a period where I intellectually couldn't reconcile that. It was like, I never stopped giving up. I do a lot of outreach and sort of, I do a lot of dialogue, debate, you might say, even evangelism to uh, people with, you know, who have lost their faith or atheist and agnostic. And, uh, and there's a lot of them in academia, you know. <laughs> As you, and uh, yeah. and uh, just like I, I went through that period. And I find a lot of people who are atheist or agnostic are very hostile to mm -hmm. the faith. It's almost like they're angry at God. And there's not a there's not a yearning, you know, there's not that, you know, that sense of joy that C. S. Lewis talks about, mm -hmm. that sort of longing for the transcendent. It's somehow they've been closed off to that. And uh, but I never lost that. In fact, I did my dissertation on joy. You know, and I think I was, it was coming from this place of longing, but I was looking for a secular explanation for that or something yeah. secular to fulfill that, that, that I could reconcile intellectually. And so, yeah, I think, it, so I never gave up on that, but I, I you know, I, I was really getting targeted with a lot of anti-Catholic rhetoric from my family because they were pretty hostile to the hmm. church. You know, they, you know, I remember them criticizing confession. I remember them, uh, you know, uh, saying that, you know, you shouldn't call anybody father. You probably know that you probably know the verse and the chapter <laughs> verse where they get that from. You know, it was like those typical kind of yeah. evangelical Christian. And that I think that's probably on some level started to wear on me, although I don't. And, and this is something that I think is worth considering is that, you know, on this show, for example, I got a lot of information about how to reconcile some of those conflicts between different theologies, yeah. Yeah. but I never got that in school. I never got that in CC, you know, like I, I teach CCD and it's not part of CCD. So I didn't have any ammunition. You know, yeah. I, when, when, when they came at me with this stuff, I had nothing <laughs> to, mm. to, to defend the faith with. That's an interesting thought. Maybe we ought to do a little bit more of that. Yeah. I, if you're, especially if, <laughs> if, our, if our children are living in a community where we know that they're getting that, we ought to be preparing. Yeah, I mean, I think my sense is that <laughs> Excuse me. it's well-intentioned in the, in the sense that I think there's an emphasis since Vatican II to work towards, uh, you know, more ecumenical dialogue. And I yeah. think that's a good thing. And, you know, and I know there have been times, well, obviously in history, there have been times where we've been at each other's throats and... Uh, and we've been killing each other, literally. Yeah. So we don't want to go back there. Uh, so we're in a good place and that we're living peacefully. But it seems like that we at least need to be able to teach our young people how to defend the faith from those typical kind of attacks. And there's not that. They're, they're, and they're, and they're very, so that those outside the church know the truth about the church. That's right. It's not just fighting it. It's, it's, it's uh, charity. 
That's right. Help me know the truth about this. Yeah, and, yep. it's, and so I got it from there. So I got chipped away there. And then when I got to college, you know, <laughs> you know what's coming next. I got it from, you know, the church is anti-science, you know, or for, you got it from two sides. The scientistic kind of critique, right? The church is anti-science, you know. The myth of enlightenment, you know, was like, you know, we were in the dark ages and, you know, we, we were, just, everything was superstition. And then suddenly in the 17th, 17th century, out of nowhere, you know, Galileo and Newton and Descartes and John Locke and David Bloom, sort of, David Hume and invented science out of, out of nowhere, you know. Uh, and I, you know, I, I didn't have any counter narrative to, def, to, to refute that, right? So I was pretty susceptible to that. And then in, you know, in literature and the humanities, in certain cases in social science, you're getting Farbach and Marx and that sort of attack on the church from that, that perspective. And uh, Nietzsche and Freud, in my yeah. discipline, yeah. all of them, in one form or another, attacking theism. And it's so insidious yeah. in the academy that I had, and I didn't really, like I said, I didn't have a good set of defenses. So I, and I, and I, and I'm somebody, because I went to Catholic school, I was taught to respect people who are my elders and my author who are authorities. So I'm saying, well, these are professors, they're credentialed people, I, and I don't have any counter argument. Yeah. I guess they're right, right? So I started to lose my faith very gradually. It was like chipping away. And like I said, I never gave up on the longing, but I think I lost my faith that I could find some intellect, that I could be intellectually honest and hold on to my faith. So that was a that was where I went through a real crisis, both as a teen and then as a young adult in college. Our our guest is Dr. Brent Robbins. You know, it's it's fascinating. I hadn't thought of it what you were describing in this way that that how many atheists or particularly agnostics out there that they have that not just lingering but underlying conviction from childhood of the reality of God. But because of all things happen, they're they're trying to find something to get rid of that. Right. You know, you've got it there, and I and it's not quite gone away. But I'm going to find something that's going to allow me to let go of that. Right. And that kind of sounds like what were you were you still had it back there, but because of all things happen in your family and all these other people that seem to say that's that's not worth listening to anymore. Okay, but I'm not quite ready to let go of it. But I'm going to look. I'm going to find it. Right. Yeah, and I would look for it in lots of different places. I, I studied. I didn't even give up on religion and spirituality. I studied all the world religions. I studied uh, Hinduism. <clears throat> I studied uh, Buddhism. I uh, looked a yeah. little. I didn't look that deeply into Islam. There was some. You know, I wasn't as attracted to that. But yeah. like a lot of people in academia, Eastern religion is kind of hip. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. it's it's the acceptable religion. You know, you can be Buddhist and nobody's going to bother you. But if you're a Christian, <laughs> you know, then then they're gonna they're gonna give you trouble. You know, so it was the easy. It was sort of like the easy way out. Maybe I can have this spirituality and but but in a way that's acceptable, socially acceptable within the within the academy. So I was I did you know did meditation and tried and dabbled in it. But I think you know on some level. I wouldn't have said this at the time, but I think in some level, I mean, you think about the whole idea in Buddhism where you're reincarnated, right? And you, you basically accrue this karmic debt over time and you literally have to work it off. Like it's, it's, they have a concept of sin, but you can't even die and escape it. You know, it's like, you're going to have to pay this off for all eternity if, it, if that's what it takes. <laughs> you know? There's no redemption right. in Buddhism except through suffering. So this, I, I mean, on some level, I mean, having been raised a Christian, I think I recognized it was kind of a raw deal. I was like, we had a savior who took care of this stuff, you know, who freed us from this karmic debt, you know. And uh, so I think on some level, I was still looking for a way to get back to Christ, you know, because I knew he was the answer on some level. Did you, uh, your studies then in psychology, um, you, you, what you're saying is that they were overtly against this journey, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think it was. there was often very explicit. Sometimes it was more subtle. I think I notice it, the subtlety of it now. I pick up on the subtle digs now that I wouldn't have then mm -hmm. that would still have influenced me on a sort of deeper level. Uh, 
but I wouldn't have been fully aware that it was an attack on the faith of my youth. And then there was just very explicit. I mean, I would say, even today, I mean, I, I work in a secular university. There's probably not a day goes by that I don't hear a student or colleague say something yeah. within earshot <laughs> that's bashing Catholicism or Christianity. It's, yeah. it, it's, it's really a kind of, it's a hostile environment for the faith in a yeah. lot of secular universities. Yeah. And even what's surprising is a lot of that's coming from people who are Catholic, right? In some cases, people who still profess to be Catholic, which always shocks me. Oh. And in some cases, people who are sort of lapsed Catholic, they'll say that they identify as a cultural Catholic, you know, but don't. almost like uh, you have sort of secular Jews who don't really follow the faith. Like there's a lot of secular Catholics, like people yeah. who yeah. they follow the traditions, but they don't really believe it or, or participate in the mass on a regular basis yeah is there a way of, ex, of expressing independence and freedom yeah i think that's part of it you yeah. know because they their conclusion on their catholic background had been one of of uh, control and and so this is the way that they can... right yeah well that's part of the message so when i say that there's a bashing it's the sense of you know, I think you really see this in both Nietzsche and Marx, and, to, and also to some extent in Freud, but this idea in Marx for sure that, you know, religion is the opiate of the masses. It's the way that people in power, the 1% is right, trying to keep everybody uh, deluded and uh, to prevent them from revolting against the, the capitalist <laughs> system. There's the uh, Nietzsche, which is that uh, both Jaism and Christianity is remnants of the slave morality that ha that is life denying, you know, and built on resentment toward our toward the master, and that uh, that you know a kind of reversion or kind of uh, Nietzsche wants to sort of flip that ethic around, right, and emphasize this will to power. I see that everywhere. Oh, yeah. That's all over the place. Yeah, crazy. The way Foucault and <clears throat> you know, the postmoderns pick up on that. So you get this sort of scientific kind of critique of religion, which is sort of like it's it's superstition, it's not based in reason. And then you get this sort of postmodern critique, which is more, I think, based in Nietzsche, which is uh, that, uh, and in Marx to some extent, a kind of Nietzschean Marxist. Sometimes people call it cultural Marxism is the way that the new Marxism has gotten expressed as a critique of uh, Judeo-Christian yeah. Western culture. Uh, and I think that's, that could, I mean, it's, the first time I heard somebody talk about that, it was like they really, I was like, okay, they really nailed it huh. in terms of what's happening. Uh, in our culture, what we're seeing on the news and everything's going on. Right? Yeah, 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 very much so, yeah. And the hard thing is that most of us parents haven't got a clue what you just talked about. No. So the point is, you know, how do we prepare <laughs> our children to go out into this world, go yeah. to secular universities when we can't? They don't have, it's, it's, it, again, we don't have, a lot of people don't have the intellectual defense to be able to provide an answer, to respond yeah. to those critiques. And they're very sophisticated kind of critiques of Christianity. They're not easy to defend. But what I, what I find, for what, I think part of, what, part of my journey was realizing that, well, I mean, there's a real, there's a truth in all of these perspectives, mm -hmm. right? There's a, tr you know, the science and the pursuit of reason, well, that's, that's good. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, so when people are attracted to that and they think, Catholicism is hostile to that. Well, of course they would be suspicious of the faith, right? right? Because reason's a good thing, uh, and uh, and I think that a lot of people that I know who are sort of motivated by that sort of postmodern critique are motivated by social justice, right? They want they they care about people that they see as being victimized or oppressed or marginalized, and and so the the movement there is to. Uh, is to a kind of compassion for those who are uh, suffering, right? Who've been excluded, and mm -hmm. I was like, well, of course, if that was if that was what the Catholic Church was about, <laughs> you know, <laughs> of course you would be suspicious of it, you know. But what I began to re what I what hit, what hit me was that actually it's within the church that all those the social justice, uh, a social justice ethics, and a science and reason find their fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And that if you if you try to extract them from the church, from the tradition of the church, they you basically you know to use a sort of a cliche that's a metaphor, but you saw off the branch upon which you're perched. I mean, mm -hmm. literally, that uh, you know as I learn more about this is what really one of the things that really blew my mind was how I just realized how utterly dependent modern 
science, science was on certain uh, typically unacknowledged metaphysical assumptions about the universe. Hmm. Reading people like Stephen Barr, Ancient yeah. Faith, Modern Science, that book was like, whoa, that was like a whoa moment, <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> How did that happen? Yeah. How, how did that happen that you would get that book? I mean, or, or that well, this is happening to you. Is this happening while you're still studying or yeah. while you're teaching? Well, I, let, me, so let me back up a little bit. So I yeah. think what, what the important part of my story that led me to going back to the church was my wife, completely independent of me, who, has, who had been raised a Presbyterian, uh, just prior to the time that I met her, uh, was involved in Catholic charities, doing charitable work in, in downtown St. Louis. And I was going to, I had gone to school in St. Louis and was working there. And we were both working at agencies with uh, people with developmental disabilities, and we would drop off our clients at the same bus stop. And, you know, she, so she, uh, I think we saw each other and then we knew somebody and then they played matchmaker, you know, so I met my wife and she, she was going to church. She was going to church at a Presbyterian church at that time, but she was really moved by the people that she saw in Catholic charities and how they, their love for people just sort of defied, you know, reason, you know. Hmm. And it seemed to be something supernatural to her, you know, and uh, and that touched her in a deep way. And so she had a hungering for, I think, becoming Catholic. And uh, I, I, I did not. I mean, at that point, I was going to grad school. I was dead set on becoming a psychologist. The last thing I wanted to do is become a become a Catholic <laughs> and then had to deal with that on top of everything else I was dealing with. So so she was going through this spiritual you know, revolution, really, uh, kind of a, a whole transformation. And when we came back to, when we came to Pittsburgh, because I came here to go to Duquesne University, just two hours from here. Yeah. And uh, so I went to Duquesne, which, by the way, is Catholic, but our graduate school was not Catholic. I, <laughs> I don't think there was a single professor who was Catholic, I, except yeah. for Father Smith, who ran the library there, uh, who had been there, you know, for I, a long time. I started a PhD program there, so I, oh, did you, so I you know, know what you're talking you about. You know what I'm yeah, talking yeah, about, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So th th it was a great program. I, I love my professors, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, there wasn't anything at the Catholic University that drew me back to yeah. Catholicism. In fact, probably just the opposite. Um, but my wife, on the other hand, was another story. So she started, she started going to Mass on her own. Wow. And then she joined RCIA. And so she got to that point in the RCIA where she was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this. And, and then she asked me, would you come to my, you know, would you come to the Easter vigil where we're going to, where I'm going to, and I, of course, I'm not going to tell her no, of course I'm going to go. It's such a big event for her. So I went and then she, and, and that was quite something. And I saw how moved she was. I, I think when she would go to mass, uh, sometimes she didn't even like for me to go because she would become so emotional. She would literally, the tears would come down her face and she would get embarrassed. <laughs> and uh, so when I went and I saw that, I was really touched. You know, that this was, she saw something here and I love my wife and I, she's a smart woman. Uh, you know, herself, very educated, someone who I respect intellectually. And I was like, Okay, what is she seeing that I'm not? You know, like that was the first time that I, I melted a little bit. You know, are you saying that her conversion was kind of drawn to the Dorothy days of the church? Yes, people, the Catholics who were living their faith. People who were living their faith. It was through exactly that yep. Catholic worker movement, yep. and uh, that was that was an important part of our our faith journey too. You know, we started a Catholic worker group in Pittsburgh serving the homeless. Wow. And uh, and joined together with other people, and we would go, you know, to the north side in Pittsburgh and bring food to the homeless, and and got to know other people who were living that kind of life, and uh, that that's really something to meet other people who are really walking the faith and who are really devout, mm -hmm. uh, and you just see that there's something different about these people, like they're, you know, what I mean, they're they're living from a whole different set of motives than the rest of the world. And they just, you know, could salt of the earth, you know. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm wondering, is it um, was part of your struggle that your their psychological categories couldn't explain that? Yes. Yeah, it was like the, you know, from from a psychological perspective, 
the general, the presumption is that people are basically driven by hedonism, right? It's a hedonic ethic or a kind of egoic ethic where people are basically self-serving, but they delude themselves into thinking they're not, yeah. right? I think that's the default, you know, that's there in Freud and psychoanalysis. It's there in B.F. Skinner and behaviorism. It's yeah. there in the most, even in contemporary cognitive neuroscience, right? The assumption is that People do things because on some level they find them pleasurable or because they're avoiding or evading pain. Yep. And so I was, I think I was seeing things that didn't make sense from those perspectives. Yeah. Right? There were people that were going into ha living lives of voluntary poverty to serve other people, uh, living often in areas that were dangerous, that were very impoverished, right? Giving up the luxuries of the world and choosing when they didn't have to because in many cases these were people who came from very well-to-do families you know yeah. and had sacrificed that to live in communities you know the poorest communities the most crime-ridden communities to serve the poorest of the poor that didn't make any sense from a hedonic ethic <laughs> I'm trying to imagine uh, some of your psychology um, um, <clears throat> compatriots there's got to be some gene mixed up here, you know. There's got to be something screwed up in their system, you know. Right. The, the, the brain <laughs> synapses are shooting the wrong thing. They wouldn't be doing that normally. There's something wrong with these people to be out there helping the poor. Yeah, yeah. I think in many cases they would see it as maybe some kind of maybe a masochism or something like that. Uh, they would look at it as maybe an interesting maybe even a fortuitous expression of a kind of neurosis or something like that, you know, that it's erotic, but somehow it benefits people. So maybe it's a good kind of neurosis we don't want to get rid of. I mean, maybe something like that, but that, but, but that would be seen as maybe not so healthy, that somehow there would be a psychological cost to it. But, you know, what I saw was these were the most joyful people that I've ever met in my life. A glimpse of... <laughs> A glimpse of the most important thing in the universe called charity. That's right. It, that's what it was. It wasn't a bad thing. It was, well, let's pause there. Uh, okay. Brett, we're going to pause there and take a break. And I just want to remind the audience that if you go to chnetwork.org, it's the website for the Coming Home Network, you'll see lots of resources uh, on conversion and other stories. But as I mentioned earlier, you, you can find the signpost where Dr. Robbins was featured earlier. So come back in just a moment. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Rodi, and our guest is Dr. Brent Robbins. He's, um, I guess I've uh, rudely paused you in the middle where your wife has come back. Right. Come to the church. She's, not come, come, back. she's, she's come to the church. Yeah, she's converted. <clears throat> and so that... Are you still... Oh, yeah. Okay. I was still very much... In fact, she was going to the church that I went to grade school in. And wow. uh, I had... So it was funny because I remember walking into the... You know, one day, you know, going to church with her and then wander back into school. I hadn't been in there since I was a kid. Everything looked so <laughs> tiny. <laughs> I was like, everything shrank. And I realized, no, I just got bigger. Uh, so I hadn't been, that's how long it had been that I had even been in this place. And, you know, I had some, you know, just like anybody who goes to grade school somewhere, you have mixed feelings because you have bad memories as well as good memories. So I had, there was some of that in there. Uh, there was a pastor there that, that wasn't there anymore that I didn't have such a good relationship with uh, that I won't get into. <laughs> but, uh, um, but in, so that was part of, the, part of my ambivalence. But also it was just, again, I was, I couldn't intellectually, I could I felt like I couldn't let myself go in terms yeah. of my desire to maybe be more involved because I couldn't intellectually assent to it. Yeah. I, I felt I couldn't be intellectually honest. So, but I, but I allowed myself certain things, indulgences. So like while we, while we would go to mass, uh, she would want me to go to mass with her and I would, I wouldn't participate in the Eucharist. I wouldn't say the creed, you know, but I would politely go and, uh, but I would notice things. You would, know, you allow, I, would you allow yourself to kneel? I did kneel, yes. I did a lot, kneel. a lot of people that aren't Catholic they won't They kneel. won't even kneel, they yeah. Even... <laughs> I, did, I did kneel. Now that I think about it, yeah, I did kneel. I didn't have a problem kneeling, but I thought it wouldn't 
it would be lying if I said the creed if I didn't believe yeah. it. So I think I was just trying to be, you know, virtuous in terms of not yeah. doing something that that was a lie. Uh, um, so, but I, I became really curious about the liturgy. I had never really got, I had, I mean, when I was a young person, you know how grade schoolers are, you know, when they were teaching us the, the liturgy, it wasn't cool to be interested in the math, you know, to be interested in the math or be curious about it. So I didn't, you know, I forgot a lot of things that I, that, that I got taught. Yeah. So whenever there were things going on in the mass, I'd be like, you know, why did they do that? You know? And so I got kind of curious and uh, along the way, one of the, I was, you know, I think I was at Barnes and Noble or something like that. And I picked up uh, Scott Hahn's The the Lamb Supper. Oh, there you go. That's such a great, and that book kind of floored me how, just how deep <laughs> the whole, <laughs> there were things in scripture that I knew about and the way that the, he connects everything, you know, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the way he connects the Eucharist to, uh, you know, Exodus yeah, and uh, to, uh Abraham, you know, I mean, the, 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 it was like the whole Bible made sense to me in a way that it never had before, yeah. all with the Eucharist really being at the center of it. And uh, that's, so I think maybe that was, I think that planted a seed that, that gave me a hunger for the Eucharist again. Uh, but again, I, 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 I was resistant and there were a lot of things. And I, what I had noticed is I was now looking for a lot of excuses to criticize the church so that I didn't, you know, so I became sort of defensive and resisted. We moved to Buffalo. I got my first tenure track job up in Buffalo, New York, and we started going to this church. I mentioned this in the little clip that's up on the old website, where uh, it was not a good experience. Like we we had this little child; he was like two years old, and my my oldest son Dean, and we had a church that was like literally up the block. We just walked. It took a it was like a five minute walk, and we would come and sit down. People would move away. <laughs> But we did not feel welcome. It was something about I don't know what was going on in that in that parish, but which is strange because it, at some point it had a grade school. I think that had the school had been closed. This might explain why mm. the school was closed. It was the there was not a hospitality to families that was there. So that kind of conf, that in a way that confirmed some of my suspicions. See, they don't even want us here, and uh, I was uh, not not saying that to my wife. Well, she was determined to find another parish that was going to be hospitable. She asked her around to a lot of her friends, and she, we drove an extra 20 minutes to go to this parish that somebody recommended that was uh, St. Stephen's in, in, in the Buffalo area. And uh, that was a much better experience. Uh, they, you know, I remember just walking in and the ushers being just very welcoming, almost gushing, you know, when you would come in like, <laughs> it's great to see you. We haven't seen you before. Like they're really enthusiastic, and that made me feel good. The, another one of the ushers really paid, paid special attention to my son and you know, would give him like a little piece of candy after mass. And that made a made big, big difference for me. And uh, so that started to melt my heart a little bit. Uh, I felt like this was a place where people actually wanted us to be. And they seemed alive, you know, in the faith and passionate about it. I found out, but well, well, anyway, that usher that I was really impressed with, <laughs> he he stopped me one day on the way out of mass and he said, Hey, we're having a retreat, you know, the, the, and it's, and I'd like you to come if you're interested. And he, he gave me a flyer. And because I liked this guy, because he had reached out, I really, I, I kind of went, I was, and, and I mainly, I honestly, I didn't go because I wanted a reversion experience. I went because I wanted to get this, to get to know this person. Yeah. Because he was first step of evangelization, his relationships. <laughs> That's right. right. Really, I just I wanted to get to know. I, I was like, I, I I really like this guy. He has this joy in his heart, and I and I was attracted to him as a friend. Uh, so I uh, I went, and it was like it was we it was several months where we would just meet once a week, and we watch we watch some films, and we would have conversations, and they would have a guest speaker, and then the 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 big moment for me was at the end where we had a full day of retreat. And part of that was three hours of doing nothing but prayer. And then the option of going to confession. So, and I thought, no way, I'm not going to do that. That was the first thing I thought, I'm not going to be one of those people who go to confession. So, uh, uh, and, but when I got there, I went in. I can't remember what we did during the day because the, the, this part of the day was so profound. But uh, they gave us some prayers and you know, on paper that we could use and then sent us out. And I went in the back of the church in a cemetery 
and sat there for three hours. And I got through all the prayers in like less than 10 minutes. <laughs> so I'm like, what am I going to do for, you know, another two hours and 50 minutes? So um, I thought, well, I guess I'll just listen. Right. And uh, lo and behold, the voice of God, I don't know how else to describe it. I've had, I've talked to a lot of skeptics about this. And they're like, well, how do you know you weren't having a delusion? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. Uh, and I was like, well, I can't prove it. But I, I can tell you that I, in the rest of my life, I was highly functioning. You know, when people have some kind of uh, dysfunction, you know what I mean, delusion, they show dysfunction. Others are like their hygiene starts to wear away. They don't do well at work. I was highly functioning. I was a ten, you know, on a tenure track. I had a professor who was, uh, you know, publishing uh articles in my field. I mean, a highly functioning family. Uh, everything was going great. I didn't have any health problems or worries. But during this retreat, I experienced an alien voice that, that I experienced to be God. And the reason I know it was alien was because it wasn't, it was because it was saying things that I was like, what? Are you kidding me? <laughs> it was surprising <laughs> me. There was, there was, I was receiving things that didn't, that, that challenged my view of things. Um, and I was given very clear directives from God. He said, one of the things he said, remember, I'm in Buffalo, New York, and now I'm in Pittsburgh. So God, the first thing God said was, you're going back to Pittsburgh. It wasn't like you should go. It was like, whether you like it or not, you're going back to <laughs> Pittsburgh. <laughs> and I got with the, and I, and I was surprised by that because I was like, we're in Buffalo. I'm tenure track. I, you know, what's the likelihood that I'm going to get a tenure track job that fits my specialty in Pittsburgh? It doesn't work like that in academia. <laughs> So I thought that was ridiculous. When, even when I went back, even my wife laughed when I told her. When I got home. <laughs> you know, like Sarah, you know, she, <laughs> she she thought it was like, come on. You know, she we were very settled in Buffalo. Like, we're not going back to Pittsburgh, you know. But uh, I'm like, I'm telling you this. And then it was funny how right after that, it was like the earth moved. Everything started happening to make that move to Pittsburgh. Not only possible, but like necessary. Things started to go badly at work, like a new chair took over the department. She was hostile towards me for no reason of my own. She just didn't like my line of research. She didn't think it was scientific. Maybe she had a problem with my faith. I don't know. And at that point, maybe people that started to get out. I don't know. But uh, but anyway, it was I started it's and then there was this there was a lot of conflict interpersonally between other people in the department that was making it very uncomfortable to be there as a junior faculty where they were pulling me into the middle of things. And it was very dysfunctional. So that made me worried, you know, that I've worked all my, I've, I've put in all this time to get to academia and, you know, and I could not get tenure. And if I didn't get tenure, it's going to be hard to get another job because people are going to see you as, you know, damaged yeah. goods or something, you know? So that may be motivated to start looking around at other places. Well, there were in the Pittsburgh area, four jobs, opened up this, that year. I hadn't even looked for the past four years. I applied to all of them and I got an offer at every single one. That never happens. <laughs> I, the best offer was at Point Park. So I took, took that, came back to Pittsburgh. So that was, I mean, to me, that was a real wow moment that floored me. The second thing that happened was uh, God said, you need to go back and and do your research on joy. You need to get back to that. I had, you know, the dissertation work that I had done when I was very much ensconced in an atheism. Uh, I had kind of tried to fit joy within this sort of a world without God, and I realized I had to go back to that and rectify that. And I'm still working on that 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 work to this day. And I did listen to that. And then the third thing was, uh, you will. He, you should volunteer for hospice. So I didn't know what that meant at the time. Um, so when I came back to Pittsburgh, I volunteered for hospice. Uh, I'll, t I'll talk about that in a minute, but because wow. that's sort of a long story. But uh, when when I was done with that, three hours of prayer, I had very clear direction, three very clear pieces of information that I came away with. I felt in a very visceral, intuitive way, profoundly moved because I felt it was God speaking directly to me. And then I went to confession. 
Because at that point, how could I not? <laughs> you know, I mean, I, uh, I was very grateful that God had spoken, had, had, had reached down and touched my life. And so I went to confession for the first time in 20 years. And uh, that's when I became, you know, like those times I saw my wife with the tears, like just the tears rolling down. And uh, the priest just try, you know, saying, it's okay, you know, consoling me. Because <laughs> I was saying, you know, I've, I denied God and I was just so heartbroken that all that time I had, that I had been denying God. Yeah. And uh, felt like a real sense of remorse that I had missed all that time with him, you know, with God, I, that, that because I had turned away. And, uh, and that was, I became just little, that whole experience lit a fire under me. You know, the Holy <laughs> Spirit just like, whoosh, became a, you know, and it scared my wife a little bit. <laughs> She'll tell you, you know, that she was like, what's going on? I've never seen him like this before. You know, I was, uh, I was, became very passionate about the faith and wanted to talk about it all the time. I've got every book I could read on it. So at that point it was like, I just, I had to understand. I had to just begin to reconcile my intellect with what had happened to me, which I still hadn't done. So then going back to, you know, going back and reading like Scott, Scott Hahn's work and uh, Bishop Barron's work on fire ministry was extremely helpful. <laughs> you know, uh, the, the, those little clips he would put out answer a lot of questions I had. Uh, reading Stephen Barr, reading some of the stuff on yeah. the history of science in the church began to completely shift my whole perspective on that, where I began to realize that, you know, science, uh, that modern physics is dependent on certain theological presuppositions that you get rid of those and the whole thing falls apart like this idea that there's universal laws in the universe uh, another person i looked at was stanley yaki yep. the savior of science yep. that book like blew my mind because he was saying because it, it, it made sense because i know science i teach science and i was like yeah why would we bother to look for universal principles laws in the universe if you were polytheistic, because there, you would depend on the particular God you're dealing with, right? So it wouldn't appear within polytheism. And it wouldn't make sense within a theistic system where God is completely sovereign, who doesn't sort of humble himself to reveal himself to us, right? Yeah. Like in Islam, right? Because that would that would be uh, beneath God, right? Uh, it was only an incarnational Trinitarian God where it even made sense to even look for universal laws in the universe. Like the, the, those are the kind of things that just were, were a major uh, transformation. And then another thing that happened that I had to, uh, from an intellectual standpoint is I went to my cl one of my classes and I said, okay, let's imagine that the Nazis had won. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Nazis won. They took over. They've trained everybody to believe that no, nobody has intrinsic dignity, right? That that some people have worth and some people don't, yeah. because that's what Nazis believe. And the, and if you don't have that dignity, then you can be exterminated if you're not good for the folk, right? If you're not good for the gene pool. If you're not good for the gene pool, right? Then it's it's for the benefit of humankind to yeah. dispense with you, right? That's the whole eugenic project. So I begin to study eugenics. And, uh, well, I was pretty shocked when my students said, well, dignity wouldn't exist anymore because no one believed in it anymore. So they thought that if, some, if there was a society that believed that, there's no, that dignity is selective, then that would be the reality, that mm -hmm. dignity would be selective. And I said, well, then that if that's true, what you're saying is that Dignity doesn't really exist. If it's just something that can change across history or across culture, then why would you be willing to risk your life for something that's merely a social construction? And they're like, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought, wow, I was, I was like, where are they learning this stuff? They must be picking it up in their classes. So I went back to my colleagues in, uh, in one of the divisions of uh, American Psychological <laughs> Association. I was on the board and we had like a listserv, and so I raised the question there. And this is humanistic psychology division is a division that professes to believe in dignity. It's, it's one of the things driving sort of a person-centered psychology like Carl Rogers is this idea of a kind of dignity of the person. Um, and uh, that empathy is healing, and that's kind of what drew me to humanistic psychology. But when I raised this question to my colleagues, I got the same answer as my students, and that scared the heck out of me. Hmm. Then I realized, 
that we're in trouble. If that if that's what people really believe that dignity is just a social construction, you know, and this was what about twelve years ago or something like that. You know, I knew that the whole thing, like you know, like a Jenga game, you pull that out and the whole thing is coming down. Yeah. And I think we're living through that right now. We're seeing a kind of a reemergence of a kind of totalitarianism, I think. Yeah. A risk of that on both the right and the left, right? Depending on who you ask, they'll usually point to the other side. But I think there's a risk on, you know, of, of, of a kind of totalitarianism, both on the right and the left, because we've lost that moral foundation within the culture. So that group would say the idea of a conscience right. is merely... It's what? just a social construction. It's a, it, you know, like for the psychoanalysts, would, people who are coming from a more psychodynamic perspective would say it's an interjection, right? So in other words, we just adopt that moral system through, in, in the classical psychoanalysis, it would be through the father, right? The father becomes... Uh, so if you have a gut level belief that, that murder is wrong, you just learned that. You just learned that. Yeah, it's not an innate... Now, there, there are some people... In more contemporary neuroscience, you try to argue that, you know, that morality is grounded in biology and instinct. Yeah, like you'll see people who do research with chimpanzees, for example, and show that chimpanzees engage in what appears to be altruistic or uh, compassionate. It's still behavior. genetic, though. It's still but it's, biological. Right. It's yeah. it's just for, they understand it from an evolutionary framework. Yeah. It's an adaptation yeah. Yeah. for survival. But the problem there is that. Uh, there's a lot of things that evolved, right, in humans, like, I mean, and, and through chimpanzees, for example, like genocide. We know that chimpanzees will go to other troops of chimpanzees and wipe them out. And humans can do that, too. We're pretty good at that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. How many times have we, did that, have we done that in the 20th century, you know? So uh, just because it's an adaptation, and it may have been something that evolved because it provided a genetic advantage, but it's certainly not morally good. Right. But you, you recognized that about 12 years ago, and, you're, and what we're doing is we're seeing it just run rampant in our, in our right. culture. Yeah, yeah, I saw it at that time, uh, and I, I kind of saw where it was going, that we were, where we were headed towards. And so some of this is a, what we're seeing today, the riots and yeah. the pol radical polarization, increasing hostility. I, it's, I saw the writing on the wall 12 years ago. And, yeah. Well, I want to make sure, because I don't want us to run out of time. You had mentioned that one of those messages you had received from the Lord was that you were going to work with hospice. That's you had right. no idea what that was. <laughs> right. Yeah. So uh, I there was two, so there was two things that so I did volunteer for hospice, and uh, and you know it's interesting because what was the most profound experience I had was in the train, even before I went and did the hospital work. I did volunteer work where I did candlelight vigil where I'd sit by people. But it was in the training, I met somebody. And there was something about this person. Like part of me thinks that maybe, maybe it was an angel in disguise or something because they had something different about them. And I sat next to her and I, at that time, my mother was going through a very difficult experience. She had been hospitalized for a mental uh, illness. Uh, and it was very traumatic for the whole family, right when I moved back to Pittsburgh, you know, and she, she was in Pittsburgh. And so I was very distressed and, uh, and worried. Uh, and so when I went to host, the volunteer for hospice, I'm sitting next to this woman and telling, and just, you know, because I'm worried about it, I'm telling her about this, you know, sort of un unloading all this. And she looked at me and she took my hand and she looked me in the eyes and she said, I will pray for you always. And that just floored me. <laughs> like, who does that? Who says, I'm going to pray for you all? So she says, I'm going to have perpetual prayer for your mother. And I just immediately felt this comfort. Like, I knew, okay, my mother's in God's hands, and this person's going to be always praying for her. So I had this incredible comfort, and I think that's why God wanted me to be there. <laughs> We got an email. Let's take this. Teresa from Denver writes, what does Dr. Robbins think are a few good points of discussion to bring up if you are in conversation with an atheist and want to get him to be more open to the possibility of the existence of God? Yeah, so I, I think that if you're, if you're with an atheist and you want to open them up to the possibility of God, 
I think it's good to sort of get a sense of what is their passion. And I think there's different, depending on the particular atheist you're dealing with, but I think a lot of times, if they're more of a, what I would say is a social justice type who really is concerned because they see sort of Catholicism on the wrong side of the social justice battle, <laughs> you know what I mean, is zero in on that problem of human dignity because they can't, without the, without huh. the faith, they can't defend it. And, th and if you can get them to see that, they'll realize they're basically, you know, th they don't have the ground to defend their own position. And, and that basically what the ground that they do have is borrowed from the other side, uh, from our tradition. So that's a big one. And the other thing in terms of the science is just educating people about the history of science. Yeah. Yeah. Like the people that are secular historians of science are showing that Science, as we know, it wouldn't exist without all the scholastic yeah. philosophy of the, of the Middle Ages. It, science really begins really around the 12th century, not, not in the 17th century. Yeah, a book, so I think that's the other thing that can really make a difference. A book that my boys read in homeschooling was a book called The Science Before Science by Dr. Anthony Rizzi. In fact, we, we featured him on EWTN many years ago. And what was The Science Before Science? It was philosophy. <laughs> I mean, that's what the book's all about. It's really showing that if you just jump into science without the philosophical background, you right. haven't a clue where this stuff came from. Yeah. You need this background. Yeah, again, that's something that Stanley Yaki does really well tracking. So he's a good person to take a look at. Um, I think that, w and Stephen Barr, Ancient yeah. Faith, Modern Science, that, that, looking at it from the perspective of physics, it's very well written. It's easy for a lay person to understand. Yeah. I mean, it's got, Great. you know, it's got a little bit of physics. If you're a little, but don't be intimidated. Like, hang in there. He's going to, take you through the he's got a lot of lectures too on youtube if you want to watch stephen barr has some great lectures on youtube but anyway uh yeah yaki pointed out that it was the people who had both training in natural philosophy and theology who brought them together the create that created the ground for the enlightenment that that uh, if you because for a while there was like you had the theologians and natural philosophers but when the two came together in the universities when they brought the theology together and created a coherent system where faith is integrated with reason, that's where the magic happens. If we're going to study something, believing that if I study it, there's going to be an answer, that presupposes a creator. Right, sure. If I don't believe there's a creator, then why am I thinking there's going to be an answer in there? That's right. Well, the, the whole idea of the intelligibility, that was the other thing that uh, I read uh, Robert Spitzer's book yeah. on the arguments for theism. And he, ha he, he draws from the Bernard Lonergan ontological argument in that book was like, wow. <laughs> like, <laughs> if you want to convince, now I don't, I don't it's, it's intellectually very satisfying. So that was, I was looking for that right away, reconcile my faith and reason. And I, I d definitely Lonergan did that for me. Now, I haven't found it very helpful for convincing atheists because it doesn't hit them on an emotional level. You know what I mean? Yeah. Even though, so they'll just struggle with you to try to, argue with you over the finer points of the argument. But the argument's very sound. I mean, basically it says, if you admit, if you acknowledge that the universe is intelligible, that anything is intelligible, and then th that's the first premise, that's the major premise, then it follows that there is a God. If you follow the rest <laughs> of the argument, necessarily there's a God. It's a great, it's a great it argument. It kind of connects with the email, John from Savannah, Georgia writes, how would you have explained a concept like morality or right from wrong as an atheist. Um, is there such a thing for someone who is an atheist? Oh, yeah. I mean, I definitely think that, I mean, what I find is that many of the atheists are very passionate. They have strong moral convictions. Uh, and, and, and they're not always, you might think atheists are sort of left wing, but not always. I find that sometimes you have very, they might be interestingly very conservative uh, politically. Uh, in some cases, they're more, even though they're, you, they're, what I find is that people are a little bit more lean to the right or a little bit more libertarian, hmm. tend to be the scientistic type of atheists. And the people who lean more left are coming more from the postmodern sort of cultural Marxist perspective. That's my sense. Uh, and those are slightly different groups of people. Would, would an atheist that has this, this really strong sense of right or wrong and act on it, would they have not examined that? I think that they, yeah, I think that what ha is, I think they get it from Christianity. I mean, <laughs> right, right, right. right. But it's like they're standing, it's like they've adopted, they, they pick up, I mean, even Nietzsche, right? I mean, is, even though he's critiquing Christianity, I mean, it's parasitic <laughs> upon Christianity, you know? So it's, it's, 
So all of this, and, and what's interesting is that I think a lot of the people that think they're following Nietzsche aren't. They're actually, because Nietzsche wanted to say that you should just have a raw, you know, just unapologetic assertion of your power. But a lot of the social justice is about the opposite, yeah. right? It's about, you know, checking your privilege, for example. Well, why would you do that? If you couldn't, if you didn't believe in the possibility of being altruistic, right, of being towards for an other, without concern for yourself, and there's no ground for that within an atheism. It doesn't make sense from within atheism. Dr. Robin, <laughs> got to have you back. Thank you We've for got lots me. of things more we can talk about. This, this is, is awesome, it. awesome, awesome. Thank you very much for joining us. On the My program. pleasure. My pleasure. And, and that was God, a lot of fun. God bless you and your work. Thank you. And your witness there at a Second University. But, yes, and God bless you and your ongoing work. And it's blessed my life, and I I know it blesses a lot of other thank people. You. So thank, thank you, you for what you're doing. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I do pray that the Dr. Robbins' journey is an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you next week. <laughs>